I wanted to ask you a few questions really from my point of view as the director and the founder of the Institute for Culture Diplomacy about what chances you see really for culture diplomacy to help. Uh, I'll give you an example. When I first founded the Institute back in 1999, I myself was fairly skeptical where culture diplomacy can really help. And I said, okay, if you have two countries that are at peace, two countries that want to work together, no problem. Academic exchange, etc. My dilemma was always, what do you do in a conflict zone? Uh, what do you do if you have two countries that maybe don't want to work together, two countries that don't have peace. Uh, is there really capacity or space for cultural diplomacy to help? Uh, you and I were discussing this morning different definitions of cultural diplomacy, how it's been practiced in the past. So maybe before I ask you the more difficult question, maybe I'll ask you just a, an interesting question as a basis. For you, what would you say is cultural diplomacy? How would you define cultural diplomacy uh, for you, let's say within the framework of, of Jordan? What is cultural diplomacy? I think uh, what it means simply is that you have to bring cultures together. But how can you bring cultures together? By building up trust between these two cultures, by building bridges, okay? Now, for example, uh, uh, the, the Arabs and the Jews, if you don't build up trust, okay, if you don't change, for example, the Israeli policies towards the, uh, the Palestinian people, how are you going to build trust? So this is what I understand about, uh, 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 I mean, cultural diplomacy. Because before, okay, uh, look, uh, the, uh, the, for example, the relationship between, recently, between Cuba and the United States. Now, it was a step from the United States they took to bring Cuba again, okay, and to build up, uh, I mean, or to bridge the culture between Cuba and the United States, and they have succeeded. So you have to start somewhere. Now they are, uh, of course, uh, uh, this does not mean that there is a full trust now between uh, Cuba and the United States, but it has started already. So this is how you bring people together, to build up trust, and this can be done only when you take positive steps towards each other. And that's what I, uh, I understand about cultural diplomacy. I agree 100%, and I think that's exactly uh, the need today for cultural diplomacy, as we've discussed very often in the classroom with some of the students. In the past, that wasn't always the case. In the past, cultural diplomacy was about persuasion. Uh, a strong example of that is the French. Uh, the French will always talk about this exception culturelle de la France, uh, or you know, this really this great cultural empire that really should be you know, brought to the world. Uh, and I think in a certain time and place, maybe that's appropriate. But of course, as we look at the Middle East, it seems very inappropriate. Uh, you know, if one country were just to show you know, the greatness of their culture, so I think what you were saying is exactly on target in terms of really the goal isn't about persuasion. It's not about attraction or, or soft power, as has been thought in the past, but it really is about that trust. Uh, so then let me maybe ask you my next question, if I may. Trust, I think, can be seen at a number of levels. Uh, if we try to look at relationships, let's say, between Jordan uh, and some of its neighbors, whether we're talking about Israel, Palestine, or, or also the, the broader region. Um, when we talk about trust, on the one hand, there's the trust between individuals. Uh, you and I were reflecting today about a very special moments at the time of Arafat and Rabin, uh, where I think there really was actually trust. And I think between those two individuals, they had actually achieved that. Unfortunately, it was not long enough, and there was the assassination and everything that came. Uh, but so my next question to you is, what could one do uh, to build trust? Let's say, on the one hand, between individuals. Uh, now, I think one of the problems you referred to in your speech as well is the leaders. <laughs> in the sense, the leaders themselves aren't really showing the willingness necessarily for that trust. So that's my first question. Is there anything that cultural diplomacy can do in terms of that high level of trust? My second question to you is maybe um, even if there is a challenge at the top with certain countries, perhaps we could do something at the bottom. Uh, you know, do you also see opportunities for cultural diplomacy to build trust between the people. Uh, you know, again, whether it's Muslims, Jews, Arabs, Israelis, you know, there's, there's a lot of groups uh, in the region there. What opportunity do you see for cultural diplomacy at a grassroots level? Might that be an alternative? Uh, and so instead of giving up and saying between these two individuals, no chance, what can be done perhaps at the grassroots level? Yes, this is very important and uh, human relations uh, are very important. As you have mentioned uh, now, there was, uh, for example, trust between Rabin, who was a great leader, and His Majesty, the late King Hussein. Okay. And this has led, 
also to signing of the uh, peace treaty between between us. Uh, and uh, so you have you have to build up trust and uh, uh, human relations are very important. So uh, you have to start at the bottom, let's say. Okay, but you need people who can understand each other, uh, who uh, can uh, take uh, steps, uh, positive steps to, towards each other. Okay. Now, if you take, for example, the the relationship between the, the, the Jordanian people and the Israeli people, okay, the Jewish people, okay. Because the, there is no trust, even at, at, uh, uh, at this level, you cannot have any, any uh, uh, meetings at this level because there is too much anti-Jewish sentiment uh, 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 in Jordan towards, towards uh, the Jews, okay. So you have to start somewhere. But we, we, of course, not all Jews are, are the same, because there are Jews who want peace, who want. So you can start with these people who believe, okay, in, in a two-state solution, who believe that uh, uh, peace can be achieved between the Palestinians and uh, the Israelis. You can find people, and uh, I have dealt with many Israelis who believe in peace and who believe in uh, the, uh, that uh, the, the Palestinian people should be given uh, their uh, uh, legitimate rights. So uh, I agree with you that you have to start at the bottom. It's good that uh, leaders meet and uh, they, uh, they communicate and uh, all this, but I mean uh, the grassroots also are very important. You raised the very important points. I want to maybe jump in with a question I wasn't planning to ask, but I think it's helpful in terms of terminology. One of the challenges that I notice as an American is very often there's a tendency to generalize. Uh, as you know, some of the recent leaders of the USA are quite known for this, You know, whether it's access of good or access of evil or Islamic civilization, Western civilization, these big generalizations, uh, which I think can be very dangerous, of course, You know, when we try to group individuals. We had a conversation a few days ago regarding Africa, uh, where you have the dilemma in Africa Africa, the political map of Africa doesn't really match the cultural map of Africa, uh, and the, very often that also leads to confusion. You know, how can we talk about Nigerian identity? You've got 300 languages, you know, all the different tribes, this and that. You know, what is it really that holds it together? So you raised an important point. And I wanted to ask you, you know, how you see the key challenges in the region. Is this about Israel and Palestine? Is this about Jews and Muslims? Uh, is there such a thing as a Jewish, you know, community or, or civilization? Is there such a thing as an as as Arab or, or a Muslim civilization? How do you see these different forms of groupings as being either useful or not useful? And, and how would you help to clarify, you know, maybe the, the key conflicts there? Because um, I think for, for many, especially at the USA, et cetera, it's, it's a problem. You know, we tend to look at these, these big labels. Um, how would you help us to clarify the, the roots of the challenge? I don't think there is a conflict of interest. The problem is that you have extremists on all sides. And this is, this is what you have to, up to fight, extremism. Because if you take Islam, uh, what Daesh and the other extremist uh, groups are doing, this has nothing to do with Islam. Because we always, you know, when we read the Quran, we always uh, uh, start, any verse of the Quran, we always start in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. This is what Islam uh, uh, is about. Uh, it's about mercy and compassion. It's not uh, like uh, Daesh is doing their uh, cutting off heads and, uh, and uh, 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 doing everything contrary to what Islam stands for. So what we have to do is to fight extremism. We have to find extre Jewish extremism, Islamic extremism, extremism from all sides. Because if you fight, because uh, 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 if, if there is always a middle way, okay. If you find a middle way, then I think you are in a good position. So what we do, what we have to do in all cultures, is to find to fight extremism. That's the main issue. Because Islam uh, or, or, or uh, uh, the Islamic uh, uh, religion. Uh, it's not a violent religion. The same with the, the Jewish religion, the, the Jewish religion, the Hebrews, Hebrew religion. It's the same. But so, the main what we have to concentrate now in the whole world, even in the United States, for example, if you take the 
extremist groups like the Ku Klux Klan or other extremist groups. This uh, pose, uh, poses uh, a threat on the whole uh, uh, the United States society, American society. So we have to fight extremism on all fronts. This is how you can have a safe world. Exactly. So I think there, I fully agree, and perhaps we should expand on the definition you offered to us before of cultural diplomacy. I think the first goal of cultural diplomacy, as you rightly said, trust. We have to build trust. A second goal, I think equally important, especially in today's current international situation, as you said, fighting extremism, uh, where I think actually cultural diplomacy can help. Uh, if we reflect for a moment, you know, what was the power of bin Laden, or what was the power of George Bush Jr.? In many ways, many would actually say soft power, believe it or not. When you think about and I'm actually quoting Joseph Nye from Harvard University here. He said the great strategy of actually bin Laden was exactly this idea of soft power. He didn't pay anyone to fly into the World Trade Center. He didn't force them into flying into the World Trade Center. He attracted them to his interpretation of quote unquote Islam. And that was bin Laden's soft power. You could argue your George Bush Jr. did the same thing. He didn't force the Americans to, to vote for him a second time, although some do debate the elections and how that worked. He attracted them uh, to this idea. You know, this, there was a crusade or access of good, access of evil, and you know, with all of the injustices that came with that, in essence, you could actually say that was soft power. So to come to your point, that's perhaps where cultural diplomacy could help. Let's make it more difficult for the extremists. The next time someone comes and says, all Muslims are like this, all Jews are like that, let's make it more difficult for them. The more academic exchange there is between the cultures, the more cultural diplomacy between the civil societies, the more difficult it will be, whether it's ISIS or whether it's the next American president. So I think that is a very valid contribution where I do think cultural diplomacy can help at the grassroots and perhaps beyond. And what is most important uh, is that you have to fight the ideology. This is very important. If you fight the ideology, because you can fight ISIS militarily, but on a short term, but in the medium and long term, you should fight the ideology. You should fight the ideology of, uh, of ISIS or any other extremist groups like Klux Klux Klan. And this, you have to start at home, then uh, uh, at school, university, at all levels, you have to fight this ideology. This is very important, to fight the ideology. I agree, and I think that a lot of that has to come with education. And I think for me, Islam was always something that fascinated me as a you know, young person growing up in the USA. You know, I didn't have so many experience, and I was fascinated by it. In college, I did my thesis, actually, looking at the diplomacy of the Hajj, uh, the Islamic pilgrimage in Mecca, uh, which many don't realize. But uh, to my opinion, the Hajj every year is one of the most impressive, positive examples in Saudi Arabia of every culture, every nationality coming together in total peace uh, and praying on the same rug and, and drinking from the same cup. There powerful examples. Many of you may know Malcolm X, you know, the famous civil rights activist in the USA. Before he went on the Hajj, he was racist. The white person was the devil. I mean, he was very, very extremist, and he was known for that. And suddenly it was on the Hajj. He actually was praying on the same rug with people he would normally consider white. He was drinking from the same cup with people he would normally consider white. It totally transformed him. If you read his autobiography, unfortunately, he also was assassinated shortly thereafter, similar to Rabin. Uh, and I think there, uh, it just goes to show, I think, in my opinion, a very positive aspect of Islam that you don't see so much in the media, uh, especially in the USA and in Europe. And now, of course, with Syria and the migrants, it's even getting worse. But I think there, you and I were talking this morning about nation branding. Uh, we should consider also, I wouldn't say necessarily religion branding, but I think it is important, as you said, to fight extremism by education. Let's get to know the diversity of Islam. There are so many interpretations of the Quran. Look at Indonesia, look at you know, Saudi Arabia, look at Tunisia, you know, the very different manifestations. Also of relationships with governments. So that's, I think, a task that we need to, to seriously think how we can make progress there, uh, I think, really around the world. So I think that's a very important point. Yes, education is very important. You know, you have, this, because the, the, the age from six years to 18 years, this is very important. So if, you, if the, the education, uh, if you concentrate on, on uh, 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 the, the, this age, I mean, I think you, you can uh, tackle many problems and you, you have to instill uh, the, 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 let's say, the good ideology rather than the bad ideology in, in uh, the, the minds of the, of the, of the students at school, at home also. Home is very important. 
I agree. I want to ask you a question about your role as a president of the parliament at the moment. But before that, let me continue with the theme that you just mentioned, education. I think we would all agree, of course, vitally important. Uh, we were discussing within that framework the role of civil society and culture diplomacy in civil society. I wonder if you could offer to us maybe a success story, an example that you've maybe observed uh, where you've seen that it actually has worked, where you know group A and group B have come together uh, and were able to form some sort of an understanding or trust within civil society. Because I've heard many examples, for example, sports or music, you know, where, where children from both sides can come together and can actually work effectively. But I'm wondering if maybe you from the region, you know, could I'll maybe just, offer... I'll just give you, give you a, an example about Jordan. For example, the Christian community in Jordan, they have been living uh, with Muslims for the last... Uh, 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 since the establishment of the Emirate in 1921, but before that, maybe 200, 300 years before that. And we have excellent relations. Uh, there, there, is no, uh, there, there are no problems whatsoever between Christians and uh, uh, Muslims in Jordan. So this is a, a live example of how communities can live together. We live like brothers, you know, and uh, even there were some intermarriages between Christians and Muslims. The Muslim uh, guy marrying a Christian girl in Jordan. And uh, we have the same habits, the same traditions. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a live example of how can people live together. Uh, and this is due, of course, to uh, the, the Hashemite regime, I mean, the king. Because the king is an umbrella uh, for all Jordanians from all origins. Even the... Uh, the uh, also, the relationship between the Jordanians of uh, Jordanian origin and the Jordanians of Palestinian origin, because after 1948, uh, half a million Palestinians, they came to Jordan, and now, now they are Jordanians, of course. So this is a live example of how can uh, 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 you live uh, uh, you know, uh, together with no problems whatsoever. Excellent. Thank you for, for sharing that. My next question is, we invited you to Berlin uh, in your capacity as president uh, of the parliament, of uh, the Senate of, uh, of Jordan. What role do you see for parliaments uh, to also be engaged when it comes to cultural diplomacy? From our point of view, we have observed in many regions of the world a distrust when it comes to government. Uh, you could look at Tunisia, the transitions, or Egypt, or Hong Kong, or you know, many examples. Whereas I really, I think we've noticed in many cases, the parliaments, uh, there seems to be really a trust uh, and a and a, and a significance there, almost around the world, you know, you know where, where people trust in their parliamentarians, they trust in parliaments. So I wonder, maybe you can even give an example of your own uh, Senate. Uh, and in general, you know, what role do you see for Senates or parliaments uh, to also have active rules in perhaps cultural diplomacy? Of course, uh, parliaments represent the people. So I think they, have, they should have uh, influence over governments because uh, even government policies, like, uh, for example, now, some European parliaments are recognizing uh, a Palestinian state. And this is a step forward, because they can influence their governments. Uh, uh, they can put pressure on governments to, uh, uh, to put pressure uh, in turn on, for example, for example, Israel, to find a peaceful solution for the Palestinian problem. So I think uh, parliaments can play a major role in this direction. So, because uh, parliaments, they represent the people. But unfortunately, many parliaments, they don't have too much influence on governments. Of course, uh, here in parliamentary system of governments, uh, the political party who have a majority in, in parliament, they, they rule the country. Mm -hmm. They are the ruling uh, power. But I think parliaments should have an influence. Even the European parliament should have an influence in, for example, promoting peace in the Middle East or finding solutions for the Syrian uh, crisis or the Iraqi crisis. So I think parliaments should play a major role. Okay. Let me ask you a second question, unrelated, but then I want to relate it maybe to that question. Uh, the issue of religion and also interfaith dialogue. Uh, we, I think, as, as yourself uh, also just stated out, are really of the opinion uh, there are many more moderates in the world than extremists, whether we talk about Islam, Judaism, Christianity, well, any they of the are minority of extremists. Um, so my question to you is what opportunities do you see for renewed examples of interfaith dialogue? Uh, and not only, let's say, re moderate religious leaders getting together with moderate religious leaders, 
leaders, but trying to open it up to have maybe at the same table members of parliaments, and moderate religious leaders, civil society representatives. Has that been done before? Uh, or what opportunities do you see? Uh, because from our observation, again, superficially, we see very often politicians will meet with politicians, heads of state with heads of state, religious leaders with religious leaders, but they tend to be fragmented meetings. Uh, and from the outside looking in, it seems like there may be an opportunity now, especially when things are very urgent, you know, as you look at Syria, ISIS, etc., perhaps to have such a meeting uh, where one could bring together, let's say, moderate religious leaders, perhaps civil society stakeholders, former heads of state, current heads of state, members of parliament. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Has of that course, been done of before? Of course, I think conferences uh, should be convened uh, in all over the world, you know, to bring uh, people together, uh, to bring people from different religions together. Uh, to bring uh, people from different ethnic groups together. I think this is very important because, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think human contact is, is very important because when you, uh, uh, when you uh, have uh, uh, a contact with, with, with the people or with people from other cultures and you build up friendship, I think this will lead to a better world. Okay, because today, for example, we have met uh, uh, all these students and yourself, and this is good, I think. You know, you can uh, exchange views, uh, uh, know different cultures, uh, you are exposed to different cultures, uh, uh, understand other uh, countries' experiments, uh, experiences. So this is very important. So uh, we hope that maybe we can convene a conference in Jordan bringing uh, uh, people together. And I think uh, this, I think, will lead to a better world. Okay. No, it's, it's very important to hear you say that. First of all, as you know, that is one of our goals. So hopefully we can discuss that, actually, to have such a meeting in Jordan. Uh, but for us, I think, of course, it's a good thing. Uh, and of course, it's positive. But where I'm interested, I think, in a world of realism, where you know, very often it's about power, very often it's about resources, you know, agendas, uh, even if it's doing the right thing, isn't necessarily the right thing. What I find interesting about the idea I just proposed, I think there's a power there, too. You know, whether we like it or not, religion is a great way to manipulate people. <laughs> That's the reality, right? And up until now, if you look at the, the media, et cetera, it's always the negative uh, manipulations they get in the media, uh, whether it's the bin Laden's, the extremists. So what if we were to flip it? You know, if our thesis is true, and if there are more moderates than extremists, then actually that's also a big power, right? <laughs> that we should actually work with those moderates to manipulate people, even though it's the wrong choice of words, for the good. And to show, actually, actually the majority wants peace. <laughs> the majority has a lot in common. You know, Muslims and Jews and Christians, we can talk about <laughs> prayer. We can talk about <coughs> pilgrimage. We can talk about forgiveness, you know, so many things in common. Uh, and that seems just like an untapped potential, uh, which is not only a good thing, as we were saying, but I think there's a power there. And so that's where we have to think about it. And again, we have to bring the experts together. I was, we have to fight extremism yeah. on all fronts, yeah. of course. So, so let's see. So I think our, our to-do list is growing uh, when it comes to cultural diplomacy and I think what the goals are, but I, but I am really interested there. We need more PhD theses for the PhD students there to try to, to, to prove this and really quantify, you know, where are the opportunities, where could we have the higher impact, but I think there is something there. So, um, so yeah, so those were, the, I think, the main things that I wanted to talk to you about, just to get your opinion as someone who has really had so much experience as a diplomat, as a civil servant, as, you know, very, the highest levels of government and now president of the parliament, just to, to get your opinion. Uh, I think we, we do really see eye to eye on a lot of those issues. We hope that we can really continue uh, this cooperation in a number of ways. Uh, but maybe before I let you leave the stage, if I may, I wanted to see perhaps if we've also inspired or provoked a few other questions or a few other comments uh, before the president uh, needs to go. Uh, I'd love to give a chance in case there are any are there other voices that would like to be heard, either to pose a question or a comment. Uh, this is sort of the, the last chance multilaterally for us to come in dialogue. Uh, we'd be very happy if, if there are any contributions or, or questions or comments uh, perhaps provoked by the, the interactive discussion? If so, just raise your hand as always. I see one hand in the back. And then as always, if you can introduce yourself so the president knows also where you're from, we can have our, our final multilateral chat. Thank you for the, my name is Edson, as I said before, from Tanzania. Thank you for, 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 for your, for your contribution to us because we learn a lot from you as a diplomat and, and as a, as a servant, government servant. Ma, I always had a question with the uh, Irani, Irani and, the, and, the, and the Saudi Arabia conflict. 
in the Middle East. They always been a conflicting part, and they have always try and try. Each country have been trying to to influence the the, the, the region. One one country under under the basis of, of Sunni, and the other country under the basis of Shia. They have been conflicting. They are in now they are in Yemen fighting. But if you go into deep on this Yemen conflict, you will see Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, you, as you said, in Syria, it's the same. So I would like to know from you, what, what do you see is the solution? And what do you see, the, 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 is there a vacuum for cultural diplomacy to, to regulate this conflict between these two countries? Because it has been there like, since I born, Iran and Iraq. Thank you very much. You know, the problem uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran is that Iran is interfering in the internal affairs of many Arab countries. They are interfering in the internal affairs of Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, Yemen, Iraq. That's the main problem. It's not a problem of uh, a Shiite or Sunni uh, conflict. It's not, it's not about religion. It's about politics because Iran wants to expand. And they are interfering, as, as uh, I said before, in all these uh, countries' affairs. And, uh, and the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are trying to put an end to this. And this is the main conflict between the two countries. But I hope that the Iranians will stop interfering, because if they don't stop interfering, I think things will escalate. Maybe it will come, because it, it is becoming a conflict in Yemen now. Uh, the, 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 the Saudis are supporting uh, a faction of Yemenis, okay, and the Iranians are uh, supporting another faction. Uh, in Syria, the same. In Syria, for example, now there are uh, Iranians fighting with the Syrian army against uh, other factions. So the interference of Iran in the area, this is the main headache for Saudi Arabia and for the other Arab, Arab states. And this is not, uh, and I assure you that this is not a Shiite Sunni conflict. It's purely political. They want spheres of influence. And that's the main problem. Thank you. Mr. President, we actually do need to conclude. I just saw there's a number of the hands, but I was given the sign. I know you have another agenda also later today, so we unfortunately do need to conclude. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, everyone, uh, first of all, to join in expressing our sincere gratitude to the President for having come and having shared with us his, his insights. Thank you very much. Thank you.